Well, uh, open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 18. Uh, we're going to begin in verse 28, and we'll be reading all the way through chapter 19, verse 16. As you make your way there in your Bibles, at the beginning of the chapter, we found Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane as he had gone there with his disciples. And as he enters into the garden there, Judas, who was, had betrayed him, had brought uh, Jew, uh, Jewish um, uh, officers who were temple guards as, long, as well as Roman soldiers and estimates could be as much as 480 fighting soldiers had come to arrest this rabbi and his, who was with his 11 disciples. And so Jesus is arrested in the garden there. And we also read in the first 27 verses of how Jesus uh, stood before two Jewish leaders, Annas and Caiaphas, in relationship to a trial, both of them being illegal. First, he stood before Annas, if you recall, and Annas is not the high priest, but he carries the authority and the influence of one. If you recall, Annas is the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the current high priest during this time, and he was also a previous high priest, and as Jesus is brought before Annas during this illegal trial because it's in the middle of the night, uh, as Annas asks about his doctrine and about his disciples. Jesus responds, if you remember, not by giving Annas what he wants. And one of the officers sitting near Jesus takes his palm and, and strikes Jesus. Jesus responds, if you remember, he says, If I've spoken what is evil, bear witness of it. But if I've spoken well, why do you strike me? And according to the text, Annas nor the person gives any response, and Jesus is led from Annas to Caiaphas. And we don't get a lot of details about it, at least in the Gospel of John, in terms of the trial before Caiaphas. But we do learn that during that trial, Peter, having already denied Jesus once, denied Jesus two more times for a total of three, fulfilling the words of Jesus that before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times and he hears the rooster crow. And that's where we pick up in verse 28 as we've uh, got to read in the Gospel of John about two trials before Jewish authorities. Now we're going to read about a trial before Roman authority who is Pilate. Now, before I even read the text, it's important for me to give you two pieces of background information. Uh, the first is this. When Jesus was being tried before the Jewish authorities, what they were accusing of him of was blasphemy. And so in the eyes of the Jews, if someone claims to be God, as Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, uh, that was blasphemy in their eyes. And according to Leviticus 24.16, if you were guilty of this sin according to the law, you were deserving of death. The problem is Jesus is actually God. Therefore, he is not guilty of this crime. On the other hand, the reason they bring him before the Romans is because the Jews, under Roman law, could not execute a man because of the crimes that he had committed. You see, the, the, the Romans had given certain um, people uh, certain governing abilities, but they reserved capital punishment to them. And so the accusation brought against Jesus by the Jewish leaders to the Romans was uh, that he was guilty of sedition that he was a revolutionist who was seeking to overthrow Roman rule, and that was absolutely unacceptable in the eyes of the Romans. But as we're going to read in our text, Jesus is also innocent of that because his kingdom is not of this world. So let's go ahead and read the text. Chapter 18, beginning in verse 26, is, uh, 28, as we consider what that interaction reveals about Jesus. Uh, then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and it was... The early morning, but they themselves did not go into the praetorium lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. Then Pilate said to them, you take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or 
did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out and again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all, but you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they all cried again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on, on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. And Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law. And according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself to be the son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was more afraid and went again to the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? And Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in the place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now, it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. And he delivered him to them to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. Where the Lord is, uh, we take time to unpack our text together. Jesus has been arrested. He has stood trial according to the Gospel of John, and John goes into two of those trials before the Jewish leaders, Annas and Caiaphas. And then, in beginning in verse 28, we get to read about the first trial before Pilate. And, and as we enter into the text, if I could break down verses 28 to 38 for you, it would begin with the accusation that they bring against Jesus. We're going to talk about the interrogation between Jesus before, with Jesus before Pilate. And then Pilate's conclusion in verse 28. So let's go ahead and pick, or, or verse 38, excuse me. So let's pick up in 28. And as we consider the accusation, we get the setting. Verse 28 once again says, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. Now, we know the praetorium is the residence of Pilate, the governor of Judea. And this is where Pilate lives, and so they are leading him before Pilate to be interrogated by him, the Roman ruler, and it says, the governor, and it says it was early in the morning. If you've been with us, beginning in chapter 13, up through chapter 17 into now 18, it's been a long night. A lot of the things that happened the night before have been covered. Jesus was with his disciples, spending time with them. At the Passover meal, there he instructed them and prepared them for what was about to lie ahead of them. Jesus was taken to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he stood a couple trials, and so Jesus hasn't slept. It's been a very long night. At this point, being struck by one of the officers with Annas there, perhaps there is some dried blood uh, upon Jesus, and it's early in the morning. And so Jesus led from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. It's early morning, and it says, But they themselves, speaking of the Jews, did not go into the Praetorium, 
Listen to why. Lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. And so Pilate then went out to them and asked them what accusation they brought against him. How ironic is this? You have these Jews and these Jewish leaders who are unwilling to enter into a Gentile residence where Pilate lives because they don't want to defile themselves ceremonially. And at the same time, these same individuals are seeking to murder an innocent man. This is the height of hypocrisy. This is a perfect example of someone who looks clean on the outside of the cup, but is filthy on the inside. These Jews, these Jewish leaders, they are unwilling to defile themselves for the sake of the Passover, and here they are seeking to murder Jesus. Truly ironic. It says, Pilate then went out to them, what accusation do you bring against this man? Pilate wants to know, what did this man do? Now, uh, elsewhere in Scripture, uh, we learn in the Gospel of Luke about how um, um, they accuse Jesus of a, a few different things. One of the things they accuse Jesus of is that he's telling people not to pay their taxes. Uh, they also say that Jesus accused him of, of, uh, of, of causing insurrection, you know, in the Roman Empire. But the third one is that he is the king. And, and the fact that he is the king means that as the king of the Jews, he possibly could be uh, raising up an insurrection and trying to overthrow Roman rule. And so Pilate asks, what, what accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered him and they said, uh, and you can almost sense the tension between the Jews and Pilate. There was much tension. Uh, listen how they answer. It's very general. They say, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. <laughs> they say, listen, Pilate, we wouldn't have brought Jesus to you if we knew that he wasn't an evildoer deserving of punishment. And, of course, here deserving of death. So Pilate says to him, you take him. <laughs> you judge him according to your law. And Therefore, the Jews said to him, it is not lawful to put anyone to death. As we said earlier, the Jews were given some governing authority and power, the Sanhedrin and the elders, and they exercised that authority and power. But what they were not allowed to do legally was to execute an individual. They were not allowed to execute uh, um, punishment, uh, capital punishment upon them. And so... They tell him this uh, after Pilate says, you take them, verse 32, uh, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke, signifying by which death he should die. Now, Jesus had told them earlier in John chapter 12, verse 32 to 33, that the manner in which he would die was not by means of a Jewish execution, by stoning, but by a Roman execution on the cross. Chapter 12, verse 32 says, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, how? On the cross, I will draw peoples to myself. Verse 33, this he said, signifying what death he would die. Now, as we've been walking through our text, even through these events as they unfold, we've been considering who is Jesus in light of all this. In light of the prophecies that he foretells about how he's going to die, how is it that he can foretell ahead of time the specific way he's going to die? We know he was going to be executed, but he's very specific, not just by Jewish execution where he's stoned, but by means of a Roman execution on the cross. Verse 33, Then Pilate entered the praetorium again and called Jesus so the Jews, they're not entering. They don't want to defile themselves. And he asks Jesus, and this is where we get to learn about who Jesus is. Pay careful attention to how Jesus answers the question that Pilate asks. Because I want to remind you, as we walk through God, John's gospel, the purpose is to invite us to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, John chapter, Son of God, John chapter 20, verse 31, so that by believing we may have life in his name. And as you hear these events unfold, you'll learn a lot about who Jesus is. So he says, are you the king of the Jews? Why does he need to ask this? Well, he wants to know, is he trying to overthrow Roman rule? Is he guilty of insurrection, of sedition, of treason? Verse 34, Jesus answered him, 
interesting way. He doesn't answer his question. He says, are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? Jesus asks him, listen, have you asked this question because you've looked at me and observed the evidence and feel like I'm a political threat? (laughs) Am I that much of a threat to you that you have asked me if I am truly a king, the king of the Jews who's seeking to overthrow Roman rule? Or is it that someone has told you what to say and has accused me of these things and that's why you tell them to me? Pilate answered a bit sarcastically, am I a Jew? He says, your own people, the chief priests, delivered you to me. What have you done? Pilate's saying, Jesus, you must have done something. These people who don't even like me, who want to go about their business their own way, have come to me and delivered you to me, which they would not want to do on every regular occasion. And yet, (coughs) they bring him there. And Jesus answered this way. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. A kingdom is the realm over which a king rules. Jesus is saying, my kingdom is not like the kingdom of Rome. My kingdom is not like the kingdom of the world. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Jesus said, if I'm guilty of an insurrection or causing, uh, trying to overthrow Rome, um, then I would have my servants fight. But because my kingdom is not of this world, I don't send my servants to fight. Because if I was trying to overthrow Rome, I wouldn't be here in the first place. Jesus says, I would have had my servants fight already in the garden and I would be protected from you. And they don't realize, of course, Jesus is God. Jesus is the Christ. We talked about it last time as they bring at least 460 fighting Roman soldiers. Like, you're going to try to come against the God of the universe? I mean, he can strike you down dead with some lightning bolts that come down from heaven or, or, or summon some angels to come and completely wipe them out. Man is nothing in comparison to God. Even last time we were together, we read Psalm 2, and it, it's as, as the as the kingdoms of the earth try to shake their fist against God, God scoffs, he laughs. That's the best that you can bring my way. This is uh, Jesus, and he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it was, I would have fought, and I wouldn't be in the predicament I'm in, but now my kingdom is not from here. The realm of my rule is not of this world. It is elsewhere. Uh, 37, Pilate said to him, so you're saying you're a king then? So you said your kingdom is not of this world. The realm over which you rule is not of this world. So are you a king? Now this is helpful for us because we need to know if Jesus is a king. Jesus answered, you said rightly that I am a king. Let me pause here for a moment because it's important for us to reflect. Do you believe that Jesus is the king because he claimed to be the king? It's so important because we can't move forward here. You've got to decide based on the evidence, the eyewitness evidences that we receive from the gospel of John and the other gospels. Is Jesus more than a man or a prophet? Is he the Christ? Is he the Jewish Messiah, the anointed prophet, priest, and king? Jesus said, you've said it rightly, I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world. Before we talk about the cause for why he was born and the cause for why he came into the world, we've just learned a lot about Jesus in that verse. This is speaking of his divine origin. Jesus is fully man and fully God. Jesus didn't come into existence when he was born in a manger in Bethlehem. No, Jesus precedes that because he is the eternal son of God, the second person of the Trinity who's come from heaven to earth to accomplish the purpose for why he was sent, to die for the sins of humanity. Not only is it speaking of his divine origin, it's speaking of his human origin that he was born of a virgin. And Jesus tells us why. For this cause I was born, for this cause I came into the world that I should bear witness of the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. Otherwise, my servants would fight. 
My kingdom is not built like the kingdom of Rome on power. Romans, you know, you go and conquer. You show your, demonstrate your power, and you rule by power. They didn't mess around in Rome. Jesus said, my kingdom's not ruled through the power that you yield. My kingdom is built upon the truth. And Jesus, of course, declares, everyone who, hears, or everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. I'd like to suggest this is a testimony to Pilate himself. I would like to suggest this morning that this conversation between Jesus and Pilate is a great opportunity for Jesus to testify of the truth of who he is. And Pilate has the unique opportunity to have a direct conversation with the Son of God, the Christ. And here Jesus testifies that he is the one who bears witness of the truth and everyone who's of the truth hears his voice. Well, the question is, does Pilate hear his voice he goes on to say, Pilate said to him, what is truth? I don't know about you, but we live in a culture in a day and age where that question is asked often. What is truth? Is truth relative? Is it absolute? The question is presented here. Is Pilate being sarcastic when he answers the que- asks this question? Is he being sincere? Is he really saying, Jesus, what is truth? Tell me more. Jesus in John 14, 6 told us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. If only Pilate could see the truth standing right before him, the truth who bears witness of the truth. This is the Christ. This is the Son of God that he has an opportunity to put his faith in. I'd like to suggest he's not being sincere. He's being quite sarcastic. What is truth? How do you know? Because in that moment, he had a great opportunity to say, Jesus, tell me, I'm going to entertain the conversation, but listen to what it says. And when he had said this, What is truth? He turned his back to the truth and he went to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him. Is this an insurrectionist? Is this a man who's trying to overthrow Roman rule? Is this the Jewish Messiah who is committing treason, sedition, and deserving of death on a Roman cross? What Pilate would conclude is, no, I find no fault in him. Let's pause there for a moment before we move forward. But as we conclude that, we conclude with Pilate saying he's innocent. And we also conclude with Pilate turning his back on the truth. We've got to ask ourselves the question, as the truth has been presented to us in the word of God, even today, are you going to receive the truth of Christ and receive him into your life? Jesus, the Christ, the son of God, who offers eternal life to anyone who will receive him, or are you going to do what Pilate did, turn your back to him? Jesus says, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. Jesus, if you remember, said, I am the door, John 10, verse 9. He who enters by me shall be saved. Jesus is the door that leads to salvation. Why do we need salvation? Well, we need forgiveness of sins. In these verses, 32 to 38, we learn Jesus is the king by his own testimony. Jesus is the king of the Jews. He's the Jewish Messiah promised in the Old Testament. When Pilate asks him, are you a king? Jesus says, you have testified of the truth. I am a king. And so as we take time to consider what kind of king he is, how do we apply it first? As the king who bears witness to the truth, because that's the kind of king he is. He is the truth and bears witness to the truth. We are invited to Believe in him. Believe in him. To believe not just in what he says, believe in who he is. If I could invite us for discussion, if you had an opportunity to answer Pilate's inquiry, what is truth, how might you answer? 
I'm sure some of you, oh, I would love to be in that moment. <laughs> if Jesus, Jesus said, all right, I've got this Christian with me. Go ahead. Anything you would say to Pilate in that moment. What is truth? How do you answer those who ask that question in general? What is truth? Is it relative? What's that? Yeah. God's word. Yeah. So God has given us the truth in the authoritative, inerrant, infallible word of God. Sure. Yeah, it's very black and white. It's not relative truth. It's absolute truth. Relative truth is a bit of an oxymoron. Uh, what is truth if it's relative? Yeah, you see it as you see it. I see it as I see it. And so, yeah, just pointing to who Jesus is. Anyone else? Or even conversations you've had. I'm sure we've all had them with folks who believe truth is relative. Yeah, Steve. Oh, yeah. So I'm hearing just the Holy Spirit who enables and empowers you to do that. But I've had conversations with folks, and when you declare truth is absolute, when you declare God's word is truth, people will respond to you and say, you're a bigoted, narrow-minded individual, one of those fundamentalist Christians. That's what I hear sometimes. I, what's that? Oh, that, or that's your truth. You have your truth, and you keep yours, and I'll have mine. It's the, you know, um, what are those bumper stickers? Uh, coexist, yeah. So we're all on our own path, and we'll all end up in heaven. You know, when you boldly declare the truth, and you declare the Bible is God's word, and people scoff at you, how do you respond to those who say, you're so closed-minded? Like, I'm accepting your truth. You believe that, but don't force that on me. Um, how do you deal with those who, who label you closed-minded and bigoted, especially those you care about in your family? They say, how, how dare you believe something like that? How, how narcissistic of you to say your truth is truth and no one else's is, is truth. So bear witness of it, and when it's rejected, live a life that demonstrates the gospel. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Anna. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So compassion, you see, folks who are who, who, where you've been, and you say, "I've I've been blinded before." Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, so good. So as the king who bears witness of the truth, we're invited to believe in him. Secondly, as the king who reigns and rules, we are invited to submit to him. Can I ask this? If someone were to ask you what a life fully submitted to the rule and reign of Christ should look like, how would you respond? What changes should they expect to see, either in you or in others? What does a fully submitted life to the rule and reign of Christ look like? Yeah, Dennis. Yeah, so love for God and love for one another, that is uh, the summation of of what it looks like. Yeah, yeah, Anna. Yeah. Yeah, so turning away from idols, turning away from your fleshly desires, turning to him, loving him and loving others. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, humility, seeing who we are in light of who God is and being humbled by our desperate need for him and being impressed by his amazing grace, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so just being broken over our, our, our you know, our state of depravity, our desperate need for Jesus. Anything else? Did I see something over here? Yeah. Um, so as the king who bears witness to the truth, we're invited to believe in him. As the king who reigns and rules, we're invited to submit to him. And lastly, as the king whose kingdom is not of this world, we are invited to invest in it. Uh, if I could ask this, how can we do a better job as a church corporately or as believers individually when it comes to investing in the eternal rather than the temporal? Yeah, James. Mm -hmm. And so our natural tendency, I think, is just to invest in the things of the world. And those things where moth and rust destroy, we put in our time, we put in our effort, we, we slave away at that while we don't invest in things that are eternal. Anything else? How can you do a better job? How can we do a better job individually or as a church to say, hey, we're investing not just in, in the things of the world, but things that last, Anna? Yeah, So seeing ourselves in the proper light in relationship to our desperate need for Jesus in all these ways. We're among the desperate, the needy, the broken, the sick. Um, Jesus didn't come for those who are well. He came for those who are sick. Anything else? Any, any other thoughts? Yeah, Dennis? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, turning to the, to the Lord and the word and prayer rather than turning to entertainment, turning to our hobbies, turning to these things of the world uh, that, we enjoy, that we tend to enjoy more than the things of God. Uh, I was just thinking as you were talking, Dennis, about being grateful, and sometimes we're more grateful for the temporal things of this world that pass away when we should think about, man, I've got salvation, um, Man, I'm blessed beyond measure that this person knows the Lord or I got to share my faith with them and they're coming to Christ or, you know, what are these eternal things? God, his word and people. 
I mean, those things last forever. Those are the things we should be most grateful for. They're the most precious things, and yet we desire and are grateful for things that are things of the world. Yeah. Yeah. So not just going about our day and worrying about the things of the day, but being intentional about investing in the kingdom by investing in people and directing conversations towards spiritual things. So good. Jody, did you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah. So it's not just a one-time thing. You come to Christ and, hey, we're good to go. We're getting into heaven, but a, a daily commitment, dying to yourself, uh, living for the Lord. Amen. And so uh, as the king bears witness to the truth, we're invited to believe in him. As the king who reigns and rules, we're invited to submit to him. As the king whose kingdom is not of this world, we are invited to invest in it. So Jesus is the king. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He reigns and rules over all things. As we continue to read, uh, Pilate asked the question, if you remember, what is truth? And instead of leaning into Jesus, leaning into the truth, he turned his back to the truth and he went to give the report to the Jewish leaders, I find no fault in him. Pilate is the one who makes the final decision in this case. He's the one, as he's going to say in a moment, who decides if Jesus gets crucified or if Jesus goes free. So Pilate has just made a good decision. He has interviewed Jesus after having heard the accusation. He has interrogated Jesus and he's drawn the conclusion Jesus has done nothing wrong. Case closed, end of the story, right? Like this should be the end of it. He, he came to, he's the one who carries the authority, but he turns his back on truth. He also turns his back on justice because he's interested more in pleasing people than he is looking to serve justice. And what we get to read about in the next verse, verse 39, it says, but you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. What's Pilate doing here? He's seeking to appease the people. Listen, I don't want to kill him. He's done nothing wrong. But perhaps this is a way to get out of it. Isn't there a custom here every Passover that we release one of the prisoners back to you? And so he says, we've got this custom. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? I mean, he's really getting under their skin because oh, they can't stand this title. This is the, ki you're the king of the Jews. And Look how they respond. They all cried again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now, John tells us Barabbas was a robber. And Mark, I think chapter 15, verse 17, if I got that right, it says that, G, that uh, Barabbas was an insurrectionist. He was a murderer as they rebelled against Rome. The reason they were arrested is because this guy's a, this guy's a murderer. This guy's an insurrectionist. This guy's a bad guy. This guy needs to remain in custody. Listen, they had three crosses already prepared, I'm sure. One of them should have gone to Barabbas. And guess who takes his place? The innocent Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In some sense, I'm Barabbas. Jesus went to a cross and paid my debt. He shed his blood for me. His body was broken for me. Let us remember you are Barabbas. You are the one who's deserving of the debt, to pay the debt that we owe uh, to, to, to live eternally apart from God and his people forever and ever. We deserve that. We're born into this world with a sinful nature and that sinful nature expresses itself in all kinds of ugly ways in our attitudes, actions, and affections. The root of the evil resides in each of our hearts and we're deserving of death. But Christ provides us salvation. The invitation of John's gospel is to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, so that we might have 
life in his name. What a good God we worship and serve. What a wonderful thing to reflect on that thought. So Pilate, he tries to appease by means of saying, hey, this is a custom, you know. Uh, you want Barabbas or you want Jesus? He's done nothing wrong. I find no fault in him. They say, give, give us Barabbas. We'll take him. 19 verse 1, and John just passes over it quickly. He says, so then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. John doesn't get into the bloody details. He doesn't get into all of the, the things that happened during that moment. He simply says Jesus was scourged. Why did Pilate have Jesus scourged? Well, to appease the people. Perhaps if I have him beaten within an inch of his life, as he's beaten and bloody, perhaps when I bring him out once again, then they will say, having mercy and compassion, this guy hasn't done anything wrong. Don't crucify him. Release him. He's paid enough. Uh, he's suffered enough. Just let him go. One commentator shares this. John's simple statement. Pilate then took Jesus and scourged him is shockingly plain. Jesus was led to the Roman garrison, the fortress of Antonia, adjacent to the temple and given over to an expert in torture called a lictor, who used a whip with the long leather tails called flagrum. The leather straps could be merely knotted or if the lictor wanted to inflict more damage, he could choose a whip with small metal weights or even bits of sheep bone braided into the straps. The iron balls would cause deep contusions and the leather thongs and sheep bones would cut into the skid and subcutaneous tissues. That's the tissues not above the skin but under the skin. So you have three parts of the skin, the top, the middle, and the bottom. You know where, where uh, the veins are. And so it cut through there. Then as the flogging continued, the lacerations would tear into the underlying skeletal muscles and produce quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. So you just got strips of skin, you know, just falling off of him. According to a forensic pathologist, the scourging typically resulted in rib fractures and severe lung bruises and lacerations with bleeding into the chest cavity and a partial or complete pneumothorax collapsing of the lung. The lictor was an expert in the art of torture and knew exactly how to beat a man within an inch of his life. And so the Romans, as they would... Uh, send these folks to be tortured in this manner. They did it just to keep them from dying. You know, just to the point that, and some, a lot of people just died because of all, some went crazy in the midst of all of it. You just didn't survive some of it. But Jesus wasn't just scourged. Verse two, during the scourging, they mock him. Uh, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they put on him a, a purple robe. Just consider, I mean, you got just... Uh, uh, skin falling off of the back of Jesus, blood coming down, and they put this purple robe on him, really pushed down that crown of thorns on his head. And then they said, Hail, King of the Jews, mocking him. This is what the King of the Jews looks like, beaten, bloodied. What kind of king is he? And they struck him with their hands. The sufferings of Christ. I could just begin here before we move forward. Who is Jesus? He's not just the king of the Jews, the king of kings and the Lord of lords who reigns and rules over all things. He's not just the one who for this cause was born and entered into the world to declare the truth, to bear witness of the truth. He's the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. And here he is beaten and here he is bloodied and they struck their hands. Verse four, it says, Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Pilate, if you find no fault in him, let him go. But Pilate is more interested in pleasing people and keeping his position. He doesn't want them to complain to Caesar, Get, take him out of his current role. He wants to keep the peace. And so he says, I'm bringing him out to you. I find no fault in him that the second time he said it. Verse 5, then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, behold the man. 
as we read that, it's more than just a statement or a story that's been told. It's an invitation. You and I are invited to behold Jesus Christ, the innocent Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. His death was substitutionary. His death was sacrificial. He didn't die because he deserved it. He died because we deserved it. He died in order to take our place and to pay our debt. This is very significant and important to hear and to understand, not just that Christ suffered, but the extent of his suffering for you and for me. Because this tells us more than facts. It tells us about a God in heaven who loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son that anyone who believes in him shouldn't perish but have everlasting life. This is good news. As you reflect on the suffering of Christ and we see the cross, which was the means of Roman execution, why does that encourage our souls? Because of what Christ did on that cross through his suffering died in our place. Behold the man, verse 6, therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him. Now let's not move any f- forward f- further. The chief priests and the Jewish leaders. This man has been beaten and bloody. Pilate, an objective individual, at least somewhat in this case, says, I find no fault in him. You would think at this moment there would be compassion. At this moment, their hearts would be stirred. At this moment, they would say, our hardened hearts have been hardened too much. This guy who is innocent has been beaten. We've just put him in this position because we're jealous of him. They cry out, crucify him, crucify him. As they behold the man who has been beaten and bloodied and not yet crucified, his suffering is not enough. He deserves death. Pilate said to them, you take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Third time, Pilate says, I find no fault in him. Pilate basically says, defy Rome, take him and crucify him yourself. There's too much on my shoulders that I should have this man crucified. But even his conscience can't get to him. It says the Jews answered, we have a law And according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Leviticus 24, verse 16. Did Jesus claim to be God? People like to deny that a lot. Whether they're false religions or Christian cults, they'll deny that Jesus claimed to be God, and yet this is why he's being crucified. His enemies really believe he claimed to be God. That's why... They're crucifying him and saying that he's guilty of blasphemy. Verse 8, therefore when Pilate heard them say, the saying, he was more afraid. I mean, at least Pilate's conscience is getting stirred a bit. At least he in this moment is saying, wow, this is interesting. He's more than a man. Perhaps he's God. I've heard about folks like this where gods become men and dwell among us, you know. And so he becomes afraid and he went again to the praetorium And he said to Jesus, beaten and bloodied is Jesus in this moment. At the hands of Pilate who who, who sent him to be scourged, it says, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. In Isaiah 53, verse 7, the suffering servant, it says this, and he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Jesus is the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. Not only is he the king who rules and reigns, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, he is also the suffering servant who died sacrificial and substitutionary death. And then verse 10, then Pilate said to him, are you speaking to me? Do you, or are you not speaking to me? Do you not know? This kind of makes you laugh when you know who Jesus is. Do, do you not have the power to, that I have the power to crucify or the power to release you? You know, it probably bring me back to Psalm 2 where God laughs. Yet Jesus, beaten and bloodied, remained silent 
And he says, don't you know that I have power to crucify you? Jesus gives him an answer at this moment. You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Pilate, you may think you have the power to crucify me or release me. Pilate, you're just a pawn. My father is sovereign and he is arranging all of the small details of the events and working, out, working them out to accomplish his purposes. We see the greatest suffering that you could ever read about, and yet in the midst of the suffering, we see the purpose behind that in order that we might have life and have it in abundance and have it forever and ever. From then on, it says, Pilate sought to release him. So Pilate, I, trying to appease the folks, trying to, you know, compromise. We, we've got to, we, we, we got to work this out, right? I mean, he's been beaten and bloodied already. Ah, his conscience is really pressing him. If you let this man go, or, and they say it, uh, oh, from then on, Pilate said to release him. Then the Jews cried out saying, if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. What are they saying to him? They're taunting him. They say, if you let this man go, we're going to report you to Tiberius. <laughs> we'll report you to Caesar. And listen, Pilate, you don't need another uh, report, bad report made against you. That guy's going to pull you out of here right quite quickly. And it says, when Pilate therefore heard the saying, what did he do? He brought Jesus out, sat down in the judgment seat in the place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It's in the hands of Pilate, let me remind you. Now, it was the preparation day of the Passover, about the sixth hour, and he said to Jesus, to the Jews, excuse me, behold your king. Once again, to get under their skin, behold your king. But they cried out, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Two things here. First, Pilate chose Caesar over Christ. He chose to please Caesar over Christ. He wanted to keep his position, maintain the peace, and if that meant defying justice and turning his back on truth, turning his back on conscience, turning his back on justice, he was willing to do it for the sake of his position and for the sake of Caesar. But not only he, but they. They say we have... No one but Caesar, no king but Caesar. Verse 16, then he delivered him to them to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Christ. He's the son of God. He is the promised king of the Old Testament, the anointed prophet, priest, and king. He is the king of the Jews. He is the king of Israel. He is the king of kings, and he is the Lord of lords, but he's also the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. Yes, Jesus is going to come back in glory and conquer all things. He's going to come not as a suffering servant, but he's going to come as a conquering king. He's coming on a horse next time. Not as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's coming back in judgment, but the first time he came as a suffering servant. Before we close, let me give us a few takeaways. The first one is this. Guard your heart from giving loyalty to any other than Jesus. Every day, you may be tempted to turn your back on Christ. Don't do it. Secondly, give your loyalty to Jesus because he deserves it. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. Don't give your loyalty to Caesar. Give your loyalty to Christ. Don't seek to please man. Seek to please God for him and his glory. No matter how hard it may be, the Holy Spirit will enable and empower you to make the right decision. And thirdly, love Jesus more than you love the world. And I open up for one last discussion question. How can we grow in our love for God while growing more resistant to the desires of the flesh? In light of our text, how can we grow in our love for God and grow more resistant to the desires of the flesh and the pressures of the world to conform to the world and not the word? Yeah, Harold. Just looking at Jesus, 
seeing him for all that he is and enjoying that relationship with him. Yeah, the truth. Anything else? Yeah, Kevin. Sure. So coming under the teaching of the word, devoting yourself to the word and staying focused on Jesus, who is our Christ. Yeah, yeah, James. But even when it's hard, you make that right decision, you'll never regret it. Never. Yeah, and you fall in love with him more. Lena. Yeah. Yeah. He gave it all for us. What do we have to give to him? Just our service, our obedience, our love. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, Adam. Yeah. He's so worthy of our worship, worthy of our praise, worthy of it all. Yeah. Anything else? Let me close this in prayer. Father, we come before you reflecting on uh, the events of the passion of Christ up to this point, we haven't even got to his death on the cross, and yet we stand back in gratitude for who Jesus is and what he accomplished on our behalf. We're reminded that Christ is more than a man, more than a prophet, he is God. We believe in Jesus who died in our place to pay the ultimate sacrifice so that we wouldn't have to die and spend an eternity without God and his people forever. And so for that, we're thankful. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you uh, for your word. Thank you for the encouragement that it reminds, that it gives us and the truths that it reminds us of. Father, we live in a world with the pressures all around us. We pray that we would give our loyalty to Christ and him alone. Father, that we would not compromise, that we would not yield to the things of this world, but we would boldly and faithfully follow Jesus, deny ourselves daily, take up our cross, follow him, and fall more in love with him every single day. We pray this all in Jesus' name. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.